So the first talk of the morning is uh, Lillian. So good morning, Lillian. Hello. Can Hello. you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Perfect. Oh, fantastic. Yes. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Cool. Where are you streaming from? I'm from London, UK. Cool. So it's super early for you. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. How is the weather? It's a super nice day here in Amsterdam. It's sunny now. So I hope I stay this way. <laughs> Shall I share my screen? Right. Welcome to Creating the Next Generation of Billionaires Part 3. Python programming for kids, mums, dads, grandpas, grandmas, etc. Now, who am I? I have a PhD. I am a member of the British Computer Society, and I'm very interested in teaching school children how to code properly. Okay. Now, it has been not un unnoticed by our young people, our young school children, our next generation, that there is an extremely strong connection between technology, Bitcoinism, space travel, success and billionaires. These smart children, they attribute all of this to computer coding or computer programming. And en masse, young people are clamoring to master this skill. Now, when I say young people, this includes children as young as eight. And I've also noticed that children between the ages of 11 and 14 are particularly keen. Also, in recognition of this great competition, contribution coding is making and will be making to society, governments worldwide have elevated the status of computer programming to the fourth R along with reading, writing and arithmetic and they have launched initiatives to have it taught in schools from kindergarten all the way to high school and the areas in red are some of the nations in which this is happening albeit begrudgingly. And I have been involved, heavily involved in introducing computer programming to young people. Now, I have recently discovered in the last few months or so that it's not only young people that are interested in mastering the skill, but it is also grown-ups. It's their mums and dads who feel that they've missed out and they don't understand, but they want to help their children. And it is also the curious adult who just wants to know what it's all about. They range in age from the young adult, the middle age to the retiree. So I started a free online simple course on this topic for the curious grown up. And this talk will describe the various teaching methods involved, the outcomes, the joys and the, um, the challenges, the similarities and dissimilarities between teaching the young people and the curious adult. Now, how do we approach this? Now, there is a dearth of pedagogy in this area. The Economist has written, the subject is so young that teachers and curriculum designers have little pedagogical research to guide them. This is in the context of school children, but it can also apply to the curious adult. To put this into context, subjects such as maths, English, history, geography, Latin, they've been taught for thousands of years, hundreds of years, all over the globe. There's a great deal of collective experience and knowledge on how they should best be taught and how people best learn them. This is not the case for computer programming for children or the curious adult. So in view of this dearth of pedagogy, I developed my own framework. Now, there is this great debate about what language they should start with. Now, should they be introduced to a block-based language first at this sort of stage or a textual language such as Python? Now, There is a school of thought that block-based language is more accessible at this stage, but I opted to introduce textual languages in the form of Python from the very beginning. The rationale for this is that if you look what children do at the ages of 11, 12 and 13 in English literature, they study the works of William Shakespeare, such as As You Like It, Romeo and Juliet. In maths, they solve algebraic equations. In geography, in the UK not so long ago, they wrote essays 
on discussing the advantages and disadvantages of Brexit, the curious adult will of course be familiar with all of this. So we surmise that young people and older adults are comfortable with and are able to manipulate symbols with sophisticated text, and they should be able to cope with a textual programming language such as Python. Moreover, Python is the number one teaching language in schools and universities worldwide, and it has great commercial currency. Now, so a decision was made to employ a bottom-up approach when teaching rather than a top-down approach. The bottom-up approach is a tried, tested, successful and traditional method used in teaching computer programming to adults. Foreign languages, mathematics are also taught in this way. Now, in this approach, the concepts and operational definitions of the concepts are taught before they're applied to a problem. It's not the only way of teaching. It's not unusual that this approach could be un alien to the modern school's child who has been predominantly taught with a top-down approach whereby the problem is specified, they then delve further to see what tools are available to solve the problem. However, the approach was well received. This was then process with the explanation that the programs are analogous to essays, modules to paragraphs, statements to sentences, and keywords to words. And we would learn at a keyword at a time and learn about its use before building up in due course to create more complex programs. The young children, the students appear to like this explanation and buy into the bottom up approach concept, although in the UK it could be unfamiliar. And from time to time, I was asked by the students questions such as, are you fluent in the Python language? And parents in parents evening said how much their children were enjoying and loving the subject. Now, with the onset of including the um, curious adults, we modified the um, approach somewhat. And here are the sort of modifications. The first modification is that the primary emphasis is shifted from the keyword to the output of the program right from the very beginning. What do we mean by this? Let's look at program one. Apples equals 10, bananas equals 12, total equals apples, bananas, print 12, output 22. So the first thing we drew their attention to was the output, which was 22. And we described how we got to the output of 22. We then changed the numbers of apples and bananas and we got different output and we also um, changed the program so the statements are not aligned so it, we get a syntax error. Now the effect of this is that we are orientating the minds of the people towards the output from the very beginning and letting them think that this is the most important thing. So right from the beginning people are correcting their own syntax errors and they're also testing them. This reduces the dependency on me as a teacher, it empowers the students and they could progress more happily and more quickly. We don't dispense of the importance of the keyword but rather we put it into a proper context right from the beginning. Now the second modification is that we think of we think in terms of small units of code or in terms of working structures of code. So the fundamental building block is a unit of useful portable code. We of course uh, the students, of course, understand the code, its logic and its structure and the output, and they can pull out these pieces of code when necessary. So if we look here for J in range 1 to 10, print J, printing out the first nine numbers is a useful bit of code, portable code that they can put into other programs. The second bit here is um, a while statement where they input five numbers, they calculate the sum total and the average. This is also an important bit of code which they can import into um, other um, other programs as well. Now the third modification is that they need teacher-led examples. It's quite important that the teacher makes up the examples and shows it to them and also to um, and highlight the importance of repetition and memory. Sometimes in the modern education system, the importance of memory is ostracized. But if you think about it, we memorize the spellings of words, poems, multiplication tables. We work out six times seven. We don't have it memorized. Uh, you know, 
we, well, we, we have it memorized. We pull out the information when necessary and we apply it to different situations. And the same applies here. So all this acts as a springboard for students to write and create their own program of uh, different scenarios. Let me just go back here to point two here about thinking in blocks. Um, now, thinking in blocks is not unusual at all. In the ancient classical language Sanskrit, the fundamental unit is the sentence, not the word. In music, we think of in terms of musical pieces. In poetry, we think of in terms of poetical verse. And point four here. In introducing the wow factor, the importance of creating interesting programs. And there's perhaps a twist in the tail to this. We found that it's not necessary really to go down the route of creating a bot or a talking robot. Just adding two numbers or getting the right password is enough. Actually, if the program works, it captivates the interest of the student, of both children and curious adults, and it has a wow factor to it. So let's look at some of the output of the children and the um, adults here. So let's look at the adults here. We were they were introduced to a worked example of the with a for loop for J in range one comma ten comma two print J. You see that it prints out the first five odd numbers. Now they went away. They had to sort of um, learn about this between sessions, but they. They went away and of their own volition, they created their own programs involved in for loops. Now, here we see 4x in range, 7, 59, 9. What an unusual combination of numbers. But they enjoyed playing with these uh, and creating unusual combination of numbers. And one um, adult said, I like it particularly about the for loop because it does all the laborious calculations so quickly and saves a lot of time. Also, codes eliminate human mistakes which could arise out of boredom and of doing the same task over and over again. You know, this is somebody without a mathematical, scientific or programming background. Immediately, they seem to understand the intricacies and the beauties of a for loop. Here now we introduce the adults, the curious adults, to a function called addition two, has two parameters a and b, and you call it a equals 100, b equals 200. Um, they were introduced to it, it was explained, they played with it during the session. And then during the uh, between sessions, they went ahead of their own volition to create their own programs. Now you can see here they've created functions, add travel, add apartments, deduct cars. And what's quite interesting here is that they went and they sort of seemed to create things, examples with applications associated with them. They were not provided with a um, you know, function with an application. And this is what they wrote about the if statement. They said, I like selection and conditional statements. I find it interesting that if, else, if, else, take into account different situations and come up with different options, which could help with making small or big decisions. Again, this is somebody, you know, people without mathematical scientific programming backgrounds appreciating the beauty of an if statement. Let us look at what the children, interested children, produced. This is from a 13-year-old um, here. They were introduced to a worked example here. This worked example here, it's a program to make a simple calculator. They decide whether they um, want to add or subtract. They select an option. They input two numbers, and then the program adds or subtracts the two numbers depending on what you know, they chose. And you can see a lot of functions here. They were then asked to extend the function or the program to include multiplication and division. And you can see by study, they managed to study the structure of the program and they knew exactly where to put the functions in of addition or rather division and multiplication. They also tested the uh, program that they created and, it, you know, they tested it until they got it correct. They, uh, another 13 year old here, they were asked to create a program where the computer randomly generates a number between one and a hundred. Um, the user has to guess the number until they get it right. And they have to, and the program reports whether the number is too high or too low or just right. Now they created this program from scratch. You can see it's got a function, it's got a while loop. And, you know, from looking 
studying the structures of different programs and by memory and by repetition you know when you they are now provided with doing something they can write it quite confidently and competently from struck uh, from scratch um, now what's quite interesting i found that they wrote a program and i gave them a sort of model answer um, but they their program was slightly different in structure from the given answer here. So they inadvertently highlighted the fact that there is more than one solution to a problem. And they also tested the program of their own volition and quite happily until they got, you know, what the program that they created correct. Here, they also created this from scratch. And here now we decided to give them some real life data. This is COVID-19 vaccination data taken from a respected uh, website, John Hopkins website. These are the vaccination numbers of the fully vaccinated people uh, at the time, a couple of weeks ago in China, USA, India, Germany, UK, Brazil. And they were asked to write a program to calculate the total number vaccinated and the average here. Now you can see they asked, should we create a program using the inbuilt function or create it from scratch ourselves? I said both. And you see they solve the problem in two different ways. They create they use the inbuilt function and they created it from scratch. Um, they were quite really happy that they used real world COVID-19 data, you know, something which is really topical from a respected scientific um, source. And also they were thrilled when they got these numbers, you know, the sum at the time of the total number of people vaccinated, 545 million and the average number, 109 million. So now, you know, um, the children, um, you know, the young people, they can uh, make small programs um, related, pertaining to real world topical data. So conclusions and general observations here. We found, kind of found that the uh, curious children seem to have a more anal analytical approach towards um, programming than the curious adults, which exhibited a more curious, uh, creative approach. What do I mean by that? Um, the the children they were more concerned with the the logic of the program. They you know wrote the program with the correct logic, and then they sort of created uh, you know went ahead and created the syntax errors ex ex later. But the grown ups uh, they were. When I say creative, um, you know, they, well, first of all, you saw the kind of four statement where they created a lot of programs with lots of different numbers there. And also they were um, more concerned about precision from right from the beginning here. Also, the, inter the children had a more intuitive grasp of coding concepts, you know, you explain something once and they got it immediately, where the grown-ups had to be explicitly taught and, you know, we had to go think over things again and again. However, when the grown-ups understood, they seemed to kind of appreciate the ideas a lot better you know, they seem to sort of appreciate, for example, oh, in the olden days, we did things, uh, you know, it took a long time to do it. But with a program, with a for statement, it takes um, a split second kind of thing. So they understood the beauty of these statements a lot better. And also the grown-ups uh, voice more interest in what would be the real life applications of all this. So you would show them something and they would say, well, that's all very well, but how does it relate to the uh, real world? However, um, you know, this framework of a teacher led explanatory approach with an emphasis on memory, repetition, blocks of code appeared to be quite successful. The children and the adults felt they were making good progress and they were feeling very happy with this approach. And, um, a quote from Albert Einstein here, he said, I never teach my pupils, I only attempt to pr provide the conditions in which they can learn. And any questions, thank you for your time.
Cool. Thank you very much, Lilian. That was a uh, that was super interesting. I'm checking in the chat. We don't have questions yet, but let's give people a, a second and see and see if someone is writing. Uh, I'm going to ask you, please remember to upload the slides uh, to our website so we can uh, be, so we, we can remove your browser so be, because uh, it's, it's easier for us. So yeah, I think we don't have any questions. So I was I would tell you thank you very much for presenting here in Europython, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much for your time.